Good afternoon. I'm the health editor of The Conversation, and welcome to today's webinar on the mutating coronavirus. Late last year, scientists in the UK found a variant of the coronavirus that was spreading very rapidly through the southeast of England. Uh, this virus was variant of the virus, I should say, was later named B117. And estimates put it at somewhere between 30 and 70 percent uh, more transmissible, um, although these uh, figures are, are, are far from certain. Uh, late last week, uh, a report from NERVTAG, which is the UK government's new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group, suggested that the new variant is not only more infectious, it could also be more deadly. And I think the estimate is, again, very uncertain, but somewhere around 30% more deadly. And since then, new worrying variants have been identified in South Africa, Brazil and America. Um, so what do these variants mean for vaccines? Can they hide from our immune system and infect us uh, later, reinfect us later? And why are so many cropping up all at once? Will the virus eventually mutate into something far more harmless, as some have reported? Joining us today to answer these questions, we have Sharon Peacock, a professor of public health and microbiology at Cambridge University. Sharon is the executive director and chair of the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, or COG UK. We're also joined by Louis Duplessis, a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Zoology at Oxford University and the Oxford Martin School Programme on Pandemic Genomics. Louis is also a member of COG UK and he studies the evolution of viruses. And we have Anne Moore, a senior lecturer in biochemistry and cell biology at the University College Cork in Ireland. And Anne's expertise is in developing and translating vaccines, particularly against viral infections, and her research focuses on vaccine access and deployment issues. Welcome everybody, and thanks very much for taking part in today's discussion. Um, there's so much jargon around these days that I feel, uh, and often using correctly, that perhaps we should start with a bit of a, a jargon buster. Um, and I think the words that are, tend to be used quite loosely um, in the media and by the public are mutation, variant, strain, and lineage. And in fact, I feel I've might have confused a few of these myself. So, Louis, I was wondering if I could start with you. Um, could you give us a bit of a definition of what these terms mean and, and whether they are, are indeed different and, or interchangeable? Sure. Um, so, a mutation is just any change to the genome. Um, so, that's quite simple. Um, so, next, I'll explain lineages first because it's a bit more straightforward. So lineage is a phylogenetic definition that's based on common ancestry. So viruses in the same lineage share mutations that they inherited from their ancestors. And we do lineage definitions mainly for bookkeeping reasons. Now, a variant is a virus that carries a specific set or a constellation of mutations. So unlike lineage, variant does not actually refer to ancestry. So you can have the same variant arising multiple times from different populations. Now, what's also really important is that variant and lineage refers only to the genotype, not the phenotype. So if you call something a variant or a lineage, that doesn't mean there's any functional change, um, such as being more infectious. It just means there are changes to the genome. And then um, lastly, um, strain is a bit different. It implies a significant change. And we are not currently using it for SARS-CoV-2, so it's more correct to say that there's currently only one recognized strain of SARS-CoV-2. So would we say that um, the virus, the coronavirus, beta coronavirus that causes SARS, for example, um, is uh, a different strain? That would be the strain. And then within SARS-CoV-2, uh, we have a number of variants. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's exactly correct. And um, we don't currently have multiple strains in SARS-CoV-2. It might change in the future, but at the moment, just one strain. Okay, great. And, um, you know, last year, I'd say for the first maybe 10 months, certainly up till November, um, you know, we were told that the coronaviruses, all coronaviruses mutate fairly slowly. And I don't think um, scare mutations were foremost in people's minds when the disease was spreading and killing and, and, and making so many people ill. Um, it wasn't really something that I felt was on in the public's consciousness. Um, but how often do the, how does SARS-CoV-2 mutate? And how might this compare with, say, I don't know, influenza or HIV? 
So if you look at a single virus, it takes about one to two weeks for a new mutation to arise, and it's probably closer to two weeks. Now, of course, if you have many viruses, you have many more mutations arising in the same time period. So if you're comparing this to, say, influenza, that's about um, two to three times slower, depending on which gene you look at. But just also remember that these viruses do evolve in very different ways. So just looking at the average rate of um, mutations occurring, that's not a very insightful comparison. Right. And um, uh, so so how many of these mutations would, would make a, a new variant? Is there a number that you say, if, I don't know, if it's got five different mutations on the genome, then it's uh, now officially a mutation? Or is it any change in mutation, uh, any number of changes make a new mutation? Sorry, I've got, let me repeat that. Uh, how many mutations to, to, a, to make a new variant? So I'm not aware of any um, hard and fast definition of what constitutes a new variant. I think it's quite debatable and I think it's an ambiguous definition. And I think for a good reason, because I think um, depending on the mutations that you see, perhaps even just one mutation could be enough to constitute a new variant. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on that with you, Louis, and I, and I think that not only if it's a significant uh, mutation that leads to some sort of change in the way it behaves, that would be considered to be a variant. And I think that the complexity of, with which we think about that is, is it will only get deeper in many ways. So I think that's absolutely right, what you've said. And um, Sharon, these are variants of concern, as I believe they're called. Um, how many are there now? I, I seem to have lost track. And and is someone officially declaring things variants of concern? Perhaps if you could give us a little overview of the, the, the main ones that have cropped up since November and, and a bit about a bit about what we know about them at this stage. Perhaps I'll start by saying why I would think something is concerning and how we define something of concern. So I've, I'm talking quite generally here that I would consider, uh, I mean, every day I think about four things uh, in relation to variants. And I use the word tilt just to remember it, really. The first is, is a variant more transmissible? Can it spread between people more? And we've seen that in the variant that arose in uh, in the South of England initially. And I'll come on to describing the variants in a, in a bit more detail in a moment. But is it more transmissible? The I in tilt is, is the variant likely to reduce the efficacy of our natural immunity that we've gained from having been infected once so that we end up getting reinfected? Or could it affect the immune response that's been raised by vaccination? So that's two characteristics that we'd worry about. The third is really lethality. So is a variant more likely to cause disease uh, uh, or severe disease and lead to death uh, than some of the previous variants? And T in looked is really testing. So does any mutation affect um, uh, the, uh, uh, the ability of a diagnostic test for COVID-19 uh, to, um, to work, if you like? So if you look at the characteristics of, uh, of, of, a, of a variant, that's the four things that I would be uh, looking for. And I think that it's, it's difficult to answer the question, how many are there exactly? Because um, not only do we not sequence everything, so there could be a great many out there that we're not aware of, but actually looking for things that are of concern is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So there are hundreds of thousands of mutations in uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. So what is important? Um, I would highlight three. I think that we can talk in some detail if, if we have time. But the first variant uh, I would mention would be uh, the B117, which you've already talked about. And that ar arose in the south, uh, south of England, and that's clearly more transmissible. Uh, there's no evidence that it uh, has an effect on our immune response, but there's been a question about whether it is uh, uh, more lethal. The second is the variant that was described in South Africa. Now, that's of concern because it appears to be more transmissible. Certainly, there's a very high incidence of disease there. And it may alter the immune response uh, to natural infection or to vaccines. Not fully, but at least there's some concern that it may uh, partially impair immunity. And then there's a variant that's uh, been identified in Brazil, which we call P1, which has those two characteristics together, potentially transmissibility and, and possibly affecting our immune, our immune response uh, to infection or 
or to immunization. So that's how I describe them. Undoubtedly, there'll be more uh, that we're going to be worried about. Um, but that's those are the three that I would highlight. And that's the kind of the, the system that I use in my own mind to think whether something is important in humans, because looking at the sequence data alone can't tell you whether it's important. You have to actually look at people to see whether something is important or not. I see. So it's matching um, the sequencing with the epidemiological data, what's happening mm. in the population. Mm. And so does that mean if any of those letters are changed significantly, the T, I, L or T, uh, that, you know, that might mean this could be a variant of concern. If it's, say, just changes transmissibility, that in itself could be something worrying. Yes, certainly. So B117 became a variant of concern um, as identified or labelled by Public Health England uh, based on its transmissibility. And so um, my, my, uh, my kind of uh, word is not a formal word, it's just something that I use to say, would I be worried about this variant? And, and if it's more transmissible alone, then yes, uh, and that would allow it to, to be uh, categorised as, as a variant of concern. So as I say, it's something that I use, uh, perhaps other people might find it useful, I, I don't know. But but it's always it's always key to look at people. The other thing is, not only can we not tell what mutation does alone by looking at the sequence data, but sometimes experimental evidence can be misleading. So if you look at uh, something in the laboratory, uh, there can sometimes be differences between laboratories because of the way that the assay has been uh, conducted uh, or because of controls that you use. So I think it's always the case that you look at people and what's happening in the population uh, when you're looking at something to see whether it's important or not. Thank you. And can I just ask the panel um, the question around naming uh, viruses? Um, it's, you know, for us to talk about B117 or uh, P1 is fairly straightforward, simple uh, way to refer to a virus that is found, uh, was first identified in, you know, South Africa or Brazil, England. Um, but there's this move, I think, believe the World Health, Health Organization, instead of pushing people to not um, uh, link the virus with a particular location. So we don't talk about the UK variant the South African variant, the Brazilian var variant, because we don't want to have stigma. Um, and then on the other hand, some of the naming conventions um, are deeply complex and would be very difficult, say, for a news broadcaster to read out a bunch of numbers, forward slashes, backslashes, hyphens, and so on. Um, how, how should we, I mean, why is it important, perhaps, uh, to talk about the difference between where virus is first detected and where it originates from? Um, if anyone on the panel can uh, weigh in on that one. Shall I start? And I'm sure other yes, people sure. will come yes. in. Is that okay? Well, um, I think it's really key. I do agree that we shouldn't be naming variants by uh, place of detection, uh, in part because evolution is happening all around the world right now. And the places that will find it are the places that are doing sequencing. So there could be um, a rather strange incentive where uh, people are doing the sequencing, but also getting labelled as the as the place that identified the, the the variant first. I think it's really key. We also don't really know for certain uh, where variants arise because people travel so much. Still, uh, a variant could arise in one place and be taken to another, and then first detected. I think it's really important that we don't have a stigma arising, uh, and 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 so that's really key. The complexity the WHO are tackling. And I think that what they'll end up doing is having a, a system of naming that's useful for scientists. But actually, uh, it's quite difficult to remember a list of numbers and letters as a scientist, actually. And so I wonder whether we need something like, um, look to other ways of, for example, uh, um, meteorologists were struggling with this back in the 50s, uh, and they had latitude and longitude. And so they'd have to read that out during a storm uh, a warning. And, and that got very confusing. And actually, if you had two storms at once, assessive numbers were difficult. And so they ended up naming storms by uh, names. Um, and they have rolling names, six lists of rolling names. And I, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, I think it's quite an ingenious way of saying, you know, as humans, we're very good at finding solutions for problems. So perhaps we need something very simple for everyone to understand uh, over, the, you know, over the coffee table what we're actually talking about. Does anyone yeah. else have any thoughts on naming, Anne? Yeah, I think, I mean, I totally agree with uh, Sharon's comments. And the last thing you want is a uh, is stigma, uh, regional stigma based on where a variant has, has been defined. Um, I, and it is, you know, I'm following this very, very peripherally, but um, to the naming conventions are very difficult. 
I suppose from, you know, for somebody who's been working in influenza, one of the, um, you know, and as Sharon said, it's easier to remember Jane and Tom and things like that compared to longitude and latitude. And in influenza, unfortunately, it does come back to where it was identified. So we've Californian strains and Brisbane strains and Puerto Rico. Um, and again, that is associated with, with places. So I guess it, it is going to be really difficult to find. And, and as a flu virus person, you kind of know what's happening in those viruses because they have a name. And it's one of the reasons I don't work in genomics because I, I can't handle four letters of A, T, C, and G, but I can handle amino acids. They're much richer context. So I, I don't know what the rest of the panel think about how, you know, what are our options? Is it going to be Bob and Jane or is it, you know, how, you know what are the options? I think also part, partly when naming these things that science should, scientists should consider what the media are going to do with them because they'll always look for a shorter way to do it. I mean, we see that with SARS-CoV-2, which is not an easy thing to type with the hyphens and the uppercase and lowercase. And so we just end up calling it the coronavirus, which, of course, if you're writing a piece about other coronaviruses, you then have to revert to, to that format. So there's always, you know, maybe there could be one naming system that makes sense to scientists and one that makes sense to the general public and, and certainly one that isn't stigmatizing. I mean, as you mentioned, we have things like Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, West Nile virus, uh, Zika, Ebola, Lyme disease, all named after places. Um, but, you know, there seems to be this move away from it. So, you know, quite looking forward to something simpler than B117. Um, mm -hmm. But, but you know, I, that's a discussion I feel that could go, go, could go on for a while and perhaps doesn't get into the, the, the hearts of what, what our, our uh, viewers are, are interested in. So, so let's move on and um, may, maybe we can, uh, if we've got time at the end, we can revisit that topic. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Lou, is that these um, variants of concern just seems to crop up rather quite suddenly um, from about November. Um, you know, we started hearing about, you know, the, the, the one that was first identified in South Africa, one that was ident two identified in Brazil, P1 and P2, um, and possibly a couple in the US. And I think there was some confusion over whether or not there was one in Japan, I think it could have been people that travel from Manaus in Brazil to Japan. Um, but in any case, um, you know, suddenly some worrying uh, variants. Is the virus under some sort of evolutionary selective pressure that it's now found a way to be uh, a more virulent, more dangerous? Or is that, as you mentioned earlier, that there's simply more people infected? Just to clarify the the variant that was discovered in Japan, as far as I know, that was travelers from Manaus, and that was actually the P1 um, lineage. Um, so it, it certainly looks like there has been some selective pressure, um, but I don't think we can really confidently say what exactly is causing it or why it's happening now. And I should also point out it's not happening now because um, it looks more like these variants arose around September last year. Um, and we also have to keep in mind that we do have imperfect surveillance. And so even though it looks like these variants suddenly accumulated up to, I think, 23 mutations for B117 within a very short period of time, and that's much faster than the rate of mutation I was speaking about earlier. So this is really indicative of having a very strong selective pressure um, so even though this has happened or appears to have happened, that could just be because we um, haven't actually sampled their ancestors. But currently uh, all evidence points towards um, some selective pressure. Right. And I just uh, and on that selective pressure, there, there was a report of a single patient with a compromised immune system uh, that was infected with coronavirus for quite some while. Uh, it was that, is that just a theory? Is that a fact that this is how one of the uh via the variants of concern emerged and um and if it is just a theory how how plausible is it i mean can, can a, is it more likely that the virus would uh, mutate that much in a single person and, and uh, drive, drive yeah. that level 23 mutations in one virus yeah um well i guess we always thought coronaviruses is not mutating too quickly but um uh, nature throws a curveball and uh the it is actually there's a a, a very nice study uh, performed um 
in Cambridge on a on a patient where they they managed to track the uh, development of all of these mutations in a patient that was immune suppressed. So when you when the immune system within a person isn't fighting against it, you know there's nothing to to kill off that virus. Um, so it can keep on growing, and as it's growing, it's increasing the possibility of of, of um, changing, and you'll have uh, survival of the fittest. Uh, of viruses that are better uh, adapted to growing in that environment. You can then come in and, and put pressure on it um, by trying to kill it off with drugs. And in this case, drugs were tried and it didn't, uh, in the case that was reported, it didn't have too much of an effect on, on either the mutation rate, uh, as far as I remember, as well as the, um, the viral load. And then they came in with, uh, they were, the patient was treated with convalescent plasma. And this is plasma from people who are convalescing from, from SARS-CoV-2 infection that contain antibodies. Um, and that if those antibodies aren't um, completely efficacious, if they don't completely wipe out the virus, then you'll kill off the virus that's susceptible to those antibodies. But again, if, there's, if there is a virus in there that, can, um, that has adapted to avoid that antibody treatment, then that then has the opportunity of growing out within that person. And that seems uh, what happened in that particular individual. So if a person is immune suppressed, um, but everything else is there, it's a lovely growth chamber. That individual, unfortunately, the immune suppressed individual is, uh, is a lovely chamber. It has uh, ideal conditions for viruses to grow into many different potential variants or different types um, that then can, the, the, the fittest will evolve from that. And then if you come in with a selection pressure with um, a, a range of antibodies, then you'll kill off the, the weakest viruses, but anything that, that is, um, is resi resistant to those antibodies can grow out. And that seems to, unfortunately, what happened to that individual. And that, from what I understand, that um, particular virus that uh, escaped with multiple uh, mutations then seems to have um, uh, uh, spread through the hospital and, and then into the community. That's my understanding. So is there any issue then with convalescent plasma as a treatment? Would anyone be worried about that perhaps driving viral mutation or is that not enough on its own? Um, I think, I, I mean, it, it's not enough on its own if, if an individual uh, who is infected with SARS-CoV-2 is having some sort of a response and they're not completely immune suppressed. Um, a convalescent plasma might do something, but in clinical trials, um, it's been shown that it hasn't a statistical uh, benefit to treating people with convalescent plasma. Um, it, at the start, it was, I mean, it has been a, a therapy that's been tried for multiple other diseases and it can work on some occasions, but uh, the last I checked in clinical trials, it showed that it just wasn't effective enough to treat people. I think then if you uh, um, give convalescent plasma to somebody where the virus has this very long-term viral infection that isn't going away, then by coming in with plasma that is a mixed bag of uh, different antibodies and even sometimes coming in with a monoclonal antibody, you are then suddenly putting immune pressure onto a potentially large range of viruses and selecting for um, for viruses that can escape that. So to some extent, it's a little bit similar to what we've seen with um, bacterial resistance to uh, microbial. So it's 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 a little bit similar to antimicrobial resistance, but in this case for for viruses. I don't so know. You, Go ahead. Sorry, I was just wondering when you say monoclonal antibodies, and that's a, a a type of drug that would just target one part of the spike protein. Um, yes, because the a monoclonal antibody is so is the is a, a kind of a single clone of uh, that has been grown up. It's it's uh, so convalescent plasma is a is a what can be a wide range of antibodies that target multiple different parts of of the uh, generally the spike antigen, maybe perhaps other proteins that are in the virus. Whereas a monoclonal antibody has been grown up and picked out in specifically because we know exactly what it does and how it binds. And this is why um, some companies have, to, and some of these monoclonal antibodies are quite, are effective. Uh, some companies have decided instead of taking, instead of targeting one part of the spike protein with one antibody, that they would target two different parts of the, the spike protein with two different antibodies. And uh, also just staying on the theme of um, sort of selective pressure, there was this 
the story of the farmed mink that I'm sure everyone saw last year. Um, the poor animals, millions of them were culled in uh, Denmark, Spain, and the, the Netherlands after it was found that they were infected with coronavirus um, from, from humans. Um, is it possible that they, they could also be a breeding ground, not a breeding ground, but a, a place where mutations could occur that could then hop back to humans? Um, if anyone has any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, it is similar to an immune suppressed patient. I suppose you would, if a virus can evolve in a, in this case, in a mink, it would be uh, predicted that it would be more, it would be selected within minks to be more um, transmissible, infectious from mink to mink. But in this case, it, it also went uh, uh, from humans to mink and mink back to humans. So there is, that was the kind of first big warning sign that that I recall that um, gave, you know, really woke us up to the fact that, you know, this coronavirus can change uh, quickly and if there is a vessel such as mink or an immune suppressed patient that allows a lot of viruses to grow and allows them to adapt and mutate and not be killed off then we we are in for trouble and unfortunately we've, we've seen that now with all with multiple variants coming out and being more transmissible and and lethal the the tilt which is a very very nice right. uh, acronym yeah could, uh, could i just Yes, please do. I was just going to say that um, that we do worry about animals, and animals uh, are often the the original kind of uh, it's interacting between humans and animals, where viruses can actually change quite dramatically, and then a new virus emerges. So I think that animals are kind of the, uh, they're a, a rightful kind of target for thinking about how evolution occurs. But actually, from my perspective, um, when I think of uh, the hundred million diagnosed cases of of, of, of COVID-19 on the planet, I think that uh, the place where uh, um, evolution is really gonna happen is actually in humans, because actually when you compare the amount of interactions we have with animals, compared with the amount of interaction we have with humans and the amount of infection we have with humans, when you look at the sheer size of the magnitude of that, I, I, I would predict that um, the majority of, of the really key mutations are actually going to rise uh, for humans uh, and as an adaptation uh, to continue to infect humans. So that's what I, I would say is really key, which argues for really driving down the rates of cases and, and transmission. Yes, I, I think now that it's come into humans, I guess, like last summer, we were, you know, a worry was that, you know, you'd have this kind of side branch you know, developing in, in animals and then coming back to humans. But now, as as Sharon says, it's, uh, you know, we it, that still could happen, but there's already so much happening in humans and human-to-human uh, -human transmission that absolutely we need to get that down as, a, as an absolute priority. We're, we're past the point, well, it, it's still a worry, but the, the, the larger priority is human-to-human. -human. But we could still have a curveball coming from, a um an animal back into human maybe maybe that will be the new strain of sars cov3 potentially don't, don't say that Anne. <laughs> doomsday sorry <laughs> so when we talk about these uh more transmissible uh variants uh the the, the first t of the tilt um which i'm gonna start using in lots of articles now um is uh, how do we know that it's more transmissible? Is this epidemiologist looking at how it moves through a population? Is it something that's done in a culture dish? Because um, a lot of the data here seems to be quite uncertain. So I don't know um, if anyone wants to take that one how, as to how we find out and why it's taking so long to be so certain. I can get started, but I think other people will want to come in. And um, when when the variant first detected in the UK was what did come uh, to people's attention, it was because uh, there was a real surge of cases actually in the uh, in the southeast uh, of the country, uh, and they were under lockdown, the same lockdown conditions that other places in in uh, the UK were under, and in other places that lockdown uh, was working and uh, prevalence that the, the amount of disease was coming down, but. In the south of england and also in london cases are beginning to surge so i think epidemiological signals are very important but there are other explanations for uh, surging cases for example uh, if people aren't socially distancing or, or following the rules then or if there's been a big event then you could have a surge of cases and so 
Having seen that initial signal of a surge of cases, you then have to do the really detailed detective work. Um, that could be through uh, 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 modeling, uh, so modeling the data, where you try and adjust for things that might confound your answer. So uh, you want to make sure that you adjust for various factors that, that could give you um, an association, but not real cause and effect um, for your finding. You could certainly look at the genetics, um, and Louis may well want to come in, but looking at the phylogeny to see at the, the rate at which this particular lineage is growing in compared with other lineages to see whether that's a, that's a true effect. You could take the, uh, the uh, particular variant into the laboratory uh, to look at how that interacts with human cells to see whether the binding uh, to the receptor on human cells is changed in any way. So you're starting to drill down uh, into uh, the mechanistic side of that. And, and there, there is a complete pathway of testing uh, in the laboratory, uh, which you need to go through before you can be absolutely conclusive. So you can see an observation, you can get supportive evidence um, but then taking it through laboratory experimentation is what you also need to do to understand the mechanisms for that. Louis, did you want to come in on, on that? Um, I think so, so far we have looked at the epidemiological um, signal, like Sharon said, and we've also been looking at the genomic signal, comparing different lineages and their growth rates together. And it does appear that B117 is indeed growing faster and um, you, you may have heard about the reproductive number, the R number, um, in the media quite a lot over the last year. And it, it does look like during the lockdown in November, other lineages had their um, R number drop below one, but for B117 it dropped, but it stayed above one. And then of course in December it surged again after the end of the November lockdown. Um, I think the only other thing I want to add there is that Aside from seeing this um, lineage take over in various um, counties across um, the UK, it's also it also appears to be taking over in Ireland and Denmark, where they've identified it and they've um, done quite a bit of sequencing. And uh, a sim similar question um, on the sort of testing or how we know it's more transmissible. Um, I see there's a, sort of a raft of tests undergoing by the vaccine manufacturers and others to see if the vaccines still hold up with these new variants how, how do we test against those how do we know that they they will work that's perhaps for someone else um, too. yes so either <laughs> myself or Anne. But, uh, do you, and do you want to take that or would you like me to sorry you go ahead Sharon. okay um so uh what uh vaccine manufacturers can do is they can actually produce uh, like a pseudo virus in in a test tube in effect to see whether uh, in neutralization of antibodies can actually neutralize those particular variants. And so uh, there are vaccine manufacturers who are doing this at the moment for uh, the new variants, and they can also see if the new variant is neutralized. So there's recent reports um, uh, from vaccine manufacturers to look at uh, neutralization of the, of the variants that we're worried about, um, including the one that was first detected in South Africa. Um, and uh, actually, based on that evidence, what uh, uh, vaccine manufacturers are doing now are thinking about uh, whether uh, they need to tweak their vaccines or whether they need to be giving a third dose uh, in a booster. This is all very, very early days. So what I say to today might not be the case tomorrow. And I think that we have to be cognizant, of, uh, aware of the fact that uh, that this is such a fast moving field uh, that, that what we say changes very quickly. But certainly uh, there, are, there are good systems in place to test variants to see whether they um, uh, are neutralized in the test tube, but it comes back to actually testing that again in real life. So doing the clinical trials, uh, looking at how people uh, respond, whether they're protected uh, from uh, 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 infection after having been vaccinated. But this is, this is a huge area of discussion and work at the moment to see whether we need to have an ongoing program of, of tweaking vaccines uh, and then uh, testing the variants that arise. And I think it comes back to uh, and again, this is a key area in other uh, virus infectious diseases as well for vaccines against those diseases, is how broad is the immune response that you generate uh, to that particular virus. So, um, you know, it comes back to what we were talking a little bit about polyclonal and monoclonal. If you can induce an antibody response, first of all, an antibody and a T-cell response against that antigen, you've, you've covered two parts. So you've, you've got two ways of attacking that virus. If you can, if those antibodies and T cells 
can target multiple different little regions of that antigen uh, that we call epitopes, then uh, again, if one of those little regions changes, uh, you still have all the other kind of bases covered by other antibody and T cell responses. And to date, uh, there haven't been any reports on how broad the immune responses are after um, uh, the either any of the mRNA vaccines or the or the adenovirus vaccines. I mean, that's just a matter of time that, that we get that data. Um, I guess from the studies that have been published in the last few weeks, looking at how antibodies from vaccinated people uh, react against these new variants, and it shows that they can, depending on the variant, it's 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 some you know somewhat reduced or or reduced uh, a bit more. Um, but that uh, it that does indicate that there's more than just one antibody response targeting a specific part of the spike that has mutated. One of the things for antibodies is that if you have mutations, it can change the function of the protein, but it also change it can change the shape of that protein as well, which is what antibodies uh, really target. Is it, they can see three dimensions. Um, so a, a mutation somewhere else, it may not be in the actual part that the antibody recognizes, but it may affect how the antibody recognizes. So a, two key questions are how broad uh, is the immune profile induced by vaccines? Do they recognize other variants? And there's evidence that they do. And the second question then is what's the least amount of immune response, be it antibody and or T cells that we need that will protect us against what you've been va vaccinated against? or against new variants. So if you only need a, a, a low amount of immunity to uh, what you've been vaccinated against or to other variants, then you know we, we have some optimism there that uh, you will be protected against uh, different variants. But again, all of these questions need to be answered and are being worked on at the moment. So thank you. Uh, and we had a couple of our uh, readers put questions on social media about vaccines as well. Uh, Hilary Hames and Lewis Crow uh, were both interested to know about updating the existing COVID vaccines. So it seems like we've been sort of, well, the vaccine makers have been fortunate so far. We've all been fortunate uh, by extension. Um, but what if we get a, an escape uh, variant? Um, how long would it take to, to, you know, make a new vaccine? I mean, we know that mRNA, the, I think the Moderna one was was made in, what was it, six weeks? Yeah. Um, but I guess we have all the stages of clinical trials to go through. Um, so would it actually take a very long time to get a new vaccine out there? Um, it will take a, a small bit of time. It won't take, uh, now that we know, especially with these new platforms, such, well, newer platforms such as mRNA, I mean, the key things about clinical trials and before you put a, a vaccine on the market is you need to know it's safe, you need to know it's efficacious, and you need to know that it's been produced a high enough quality to give you that safety. And we know that now for the vaccines that are on the market. So there's there's less of a risk of going back in and making a new uh, vaccine to a new antigen. Um, so that has taken away some of the time that's required for it. You, it's likely that we will still have to, it's more than likely that we'll still have to have uh, at least phase what we call phase one clinical trials to show that this new um, vaccine with the, or new antigen in the vaccine will induce uh, the immune responses that's required against that new variant and also look at safety as well. You never know sometimes you can even though you think it's just a different antigen, it's the same platform, it'll be okay. You do need to formally prove that as well. But it's unlikely that we'll have to go to you know 30,000 uh, person people trials to to look at efficacy i mean obviously we'll look at it then post licensing so it shouldn't i mean even the fact that it only took you know i mean january first you know march was the phase one trial november you know we've, we've been through phase three in in the lifespan of developing a vaccine it's a very short space of time but it could be shorter still if we have to uh, put in a new antigen it will still take a little bit of time and that's also, I mean, a lot of time and effort has gone in for the last 20 years into preparing uh, for a pandemic from a vaccine perspective. How do we do this really quickly? How do we scale up? What are, what are the regulatory requirements to change antigens quite quickly? So all that 20 years of work is now coming into coming to fruition. That is reassuring. Um, I see that we are getting near to Q&A time from uh, our uh, viewers. Um, so if I could perhaps just move on to the last question, uh, which is for the panel. And um, uh, just, you know, th there's this uh, law of declining virulence. I think somebody called Theobald Smith came up with in the last century. 
um, that sort of says, you know, all viruses will uh, seek to become um, more transmissible but less harmful. And um, it, it sort of gives some, uh, you know, comfort. But is it a false comfort? I mean, how likely uh, or how optimistic does the panel feel um, about this virus um, eventually becoming as benign as the common cold, say? Do you mind if I start? Go ahead, Louis. Um, so I don't think that's really a, a law as such. Um, so natural selection will favor the virus that results in the most onward transmission. So therefore, all other things being e equal, the virus that keeps a host infected the longest will win out. So if we assume that transmissibility is correlated with, correlated with virulence, then the more transmissible the virus is, it will kill hosts earlier and therefore have less reproductive success. So then that results in selection for a transmission virulence trade-off. And so that might result in the virus becoming more B9, but it doesn't necessarily result in it becoming just less and less um, virulent. However, um, for this to hold, you do need several assumptions. You do need to have this um, correlation between virulence and transmissibility, but also um, you need to have virulence um, increasing faster than transmissibility. And then lastly, you also need a system that's in equilibrium. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 is still in an invasion phase. So now it's growing exponentially, and that means only the first transmission matters and not the lifetime reproductive success of the virus. And so in this case, it is actually possible for selection to favor higher virulence. So I think it's, it's, it's simplifying things way too much to just say that there's a law of declining virulence. And I think in the real world, we don't actually know what's going to happen. Um, what I think is possibly more likely to happen is that the virus doesn't change um, that much in a very short time period. Um, but it's probably more likely that the population as a whole builds up some sort of immunity through perhaps childhood exposure. And so from the outside, it might appear to be more benign. Does um, I uh, uh, else says, and or Sharon, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I guess the, oh. yeah, so I think, um, the, the, they're all very good points and 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 uh one other point then i think is you know is the concern of the virulence and our ability to treat that virulence as well and as time goes on hopefully we will have uh extremely effective uh, prophylactics such as vaccines or other uh treatments we we now have some good treatments when people are extremely sick but hopefully we'll have some good therapeutics to prevent people even getting to that point of, of severe infection. So I think there's that other side of it as well, uh, which is a little bit, well, not quite as, as dependent on, on the virus itself. It's, it's more dependent on uh, medicine coming up with some good alternatives to it. And, and from my perspective, in terms of, of, uh, of, of virulence, I, I think for me, I feel that we, we shouldn't make any assumptions because it, it's quite easy to say, I, I know that, there's this this law of declining virulence, or I understand what happened before. Uh, I think for me, I've become very, I've tried to become very pragmatic during this this um, this pandemic and expect anything uh, and and not exclude anything. So for me, I think being prepared is really important, and being prepared means being very watchful. So we'll only find if something is more uh, is more uh, virulent or lethal if we're collecting the data. So actually really focusing on collecting data on people in the community and in hospitals to see if they appear to be getting more severe disease and if they appear to be unfortunately uh, dying as a result. That, that, um, that watchfulness is part of our preparation. But, you know, at the end of the day, the key thing is to be reducing transmission um, as much as possible. Uh, and so uh, I come back to the fact that there's been so many cases globally it does give the virus a great opportunity to mutate. So really, really focusing on trying to drive down transmission and following the rules and doing what we need to around uh, hands, face and space. For me, that's such an important message. 
Thanks, Sharon. I think we need to move on to the Q&A now um, because we have some uh, questions coming in from our uh, viewers. And the first one from Steve Smart, how do we know a new variant has been discovered? Is there an obligation to inform World Health or the World Health Organization? Is there a danger that some variants won't be owned by some countries? Um, Sharon, this seems like a natural one for you, but anyone yeah. else can uh, can. Thank you. In. I mean, Steve, that's a really important question. It's actually quite a, a, a tough one to answer too. I think that we'd all recognize the World Health, Health Organization as the key organization for organizing uh, global um, uh, surveillance. And, and I think that that's going to take a sort of multi-layered approach that certainly we need to have global networks uh, for sequencing capabilities so we can actually spot these things, but then global sharing. And I think that your, your point comes back to sharing because actually in this day and age, for example, in COG UK, we share all of our genomes. So we've, we've had more than 200,000 genomes generated. Everything gets shared and anybody can look at that data. So there's no, there's no hiding place for that data actually. And, and uh, people can sit at their, at, their, at their coffee table and have a look at that. I think the concern is that if we don't get the data sharing right, and that's where it starts for me, then there's a problem. So I think that WHO have a clear role in, in both encouraging uh, global networks of sequencing and, and data platforms together with global information data sharing. Um, and, and so that collective uh, sharing, I mean, we're, we're not quite there yet in all honesty because many countries are not doing any sequencing at all. So the alternative to not declaring something is that actually you don't know. And, and I think both situations are pretty tough. So if you're not sequencing at all, uh, then you can only rely on what you observe um, through epidemiology. Uh, so I think the, um, it's a combination of, of getting our global network of sequencing capabilities right, um, sharing the information freely that comes from that so that there isn't any possibility uh, that that uh, that somebody might not reveal what's going on, uh, but I think that we've got some mileage to go in that. And, and as I say, I think WHO is going to play a critical role um, in doing exactly that. Great, thank you, Sharon. Um, do we have any more questions from our viewers? Wendy Hartman, does the delay in giving the second vaccine make it more likely that a stronger mutation might survive and thrive? Yes, uh, question that's been in many people's minds. Um, similar to antibiotic resistance. Um, who would like to take that one? Um, and that's a vaccinology yeah. type um, question. Yeah, it, it, the answer to that is yes. I mean, if you, I, I guess it depends on the vaccine. If a vaccine, uh, a single shot of a vaccine induces an immune response, and we're constantly thinking about antibodies, but there are T cells in there as well that um, aren't uh, very robust, either in magnitude or in quality. Um, so you have this um, sort of average immune response going on, and then you're you're challenged with a virus. Uh, again, that it, that virus could grow in you, and it will avoid the immune response that you've you've uh, uh, created because of the vaccine. So uh, this uh, low affinity, low magnitude, uh, kind of uh, you know, not very robust uh, immune response induced by a vaccine is a good breeding ground for a new virus and a vi for a virus to keep growing and a new virus variant to emerge. So it is, for, from a vaccine perspective, it is hugely important that we induce uh, a, you know, the, the, the best, most robust immune response that we can as, as quickly as we can in each individual um, so that individuals are uh, protected against disease and hopefully with other vaccines uh, maybe the ones that are there at the moment but more likely the ones that are coming uh, hopefully kind of the next generations will prevent transmission as well and um, so it is we need to protect it's a bit like flood defenses if you don't put up a good flood defense you're going to get flooded Great may analogy. i just may i just come in uh, what i would say is that this is a really difficult situation because we've got the certainty that we have people in the country who are not protected uh, and who are vulnerable to infection. And we want to save as many lives as we can. And so we have the certainty that um, until we vaccinate that, the, uh, that we could continue to see uh, ongoing uh, disease with uh, the sad, outco sad outcomes that we do see. That's balanced with the uncertainty of whether a mutation will arise. And we know that mutations are occurring uh, completely randomly. 
uh, and that some are selected for because they have a kind of they confer a, uh, it's like survival of the fittest they confer a selective advantage on that particular variant but what would might what emerge from that is is quite uncertain so i think that the uh, the, the the proposition that we face in this country is that people are having the first dose uh, as many people as possible are having the first dose uh, rather than a smaller number of people are having both doses. And I think that's right. I think that we have to go with the certainty that we need to protect as many people as possible and not, uh, and of course, study the the uh, the uh, the downside around the emergence of uh, mutations or the level of immunity that you can acquire from from one 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 jab. But I think that it was a tough decision, and I, I think that in the UK, uh, I, I support that decision because we just want to drive down uh, the, the 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 terrible toll that this is taking on the country at the moment. I think it comes back to as well how what is the minimum immune response that's needed, and is the immune response that you generate after the uh, first vaccine of doesn't matter which vaccine it is of the right quality and quantity to protect. And we know from clinical trials that it's not as good as two vaccines to, you know, as the booster vaccine and in, in adults and more so in the elderly. Um, that is clinical trials. That's a maximum of 30,000 people. Um, you know, and the, the, the efficacy was, uh, was, uh, quantified from that. And we'll see from a, a larger population, you know, if that efficacy will probably be a little bit lower after two shots and it'll probably be lower after a single shot as well. I think it is important to uh, generate as robust an immune response in vulnerable people, which is even more difficult um, for, for medically vulnerable, for the elderly, their immune response isn't as strong as adults. Luckily with the vaccines that have been uh, granted authorization, uh, the immune responses seem to be okay. But again, it comes back to that critical question, what is okay to protect and what is okay to prevent uh, variants emerging? We don't know. We'll have to wait and see what the payoff is, um, I guess. Um, but th thank you very much for that. We have uh, another question here, one from Arlene Jane Harris. Any ideas as to why more variants have not so far been identified in the UK? when there's so much of the virus around. Um, Louis, perhaps you want to answer this one? Um, I don't actually know, um, because we don't know what caused the variants, what caused the one variant that possibly emerged in the UK to emerge in the UK. So if we, had no, if we knew this, we could answer this better. Um, it could just be that um, it occurred by chance and we hadn't had that pure random mutation occurring more times to um, drive the virus there. But it could also be uh, that there really was a specific um, selective pressure, for instance, an immunocompromised patient, and that would be a very rare occurrence and wouldn't have happened that many times. But of course, the possibly it's, it's more important to look forward and think about where we're going with this in the future. And I think we will probably see more variants arising or being identified um, over the next few months. They have probably arisen already. Um, and the key thing is to keep, to try to get numbers down because if you have, the more um, variants emerge because there has to first be a supply of mutations. Without a supply of mutations, you can't have a new variant emerging. And, um, the more cases there are, the more possible mutations there are. So we need to keep cases down to have less possible mutations around um, so that no new variants could arise. Now, the second part is selective pressure. Um, so first you need mutations and then a selective pressure to drive a variant into um, selecting for those mutations and then um, out competing other lineages. Uh, and that, that, may I just add to that and just say that um, uh, we, we really get, uh, we, we focus on particular variants because they have a trait that we, that's, that's, um, that's harmful to humans, like increased transmissibility. But actually there are a very large number of variants because every time uh, a new mutation arises, that's basically a new variant. So there are hundreds of thousands of mutations in the genome. Uh, there are new, uh, 
numerous numbers of, of variants uh, and that will continue over time. So I think that there are many, many variants. It's just the fact that, that many variants don't bother us because they're no more serious uh, and could even be less serious than the ones that are already circulating. So we, we tend to try and um, pick out like a needle in a haystack that kind of constellation of mutations in a given variant that is going to be important for us that we need to know about and track. We can't track everything that's going on. And, 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 and as Louis said, there may be variants in the, in, in, our, in the viral population at the moment that do have some characteristic that we should be looking out for. And the key is to really do all of the monitoring we need to do to detect the kind of the human signal uh, that, that we should be worried about this. So that just, just to summarize, there are a very large number of variants, but we really only talk about the ones that we're particularly worried about in terms of human health. So if I could loop back to the very first question Clint asked, yeah, um, we've got, um, so we do have a very bad way of naming variants at the moment, and we need a better way of naming them, but it's not going to help for us to name every single variant that's out there. That would just be confusing. So we do have a lineage naming system, which we are using within COG UK and other people are using it as well, which we're using to track different lineages of the virus as they are emerging. And variants do belong to different lineages as well. Um, so we do have many, many lineages that we are tracking um, as they're arising and possibly getting extinct. And from there, we identify new variants. Um, but then a variant can become a variant under investigation, which might be concerning, and then might become a variant of concern, which is what B117 is. Thanks, Louis. Um, I just wonder if we have time for one more question. Uh, well, our hour is nearly up. Um, from One from Elaine. Um, Elaine, I won't pronounce your surname. I'm, uh, I, I might mangle it. Um, is a person recovering likely to be incubated more harmful, in, incubating more harmful variants in the later stages if natural immunity has combated the less harmful variants? That is, does a person then create a greater risk? I guess if natural immunity has kicked in, then the virus load is going down and they're um, um, eliminating that virus and a um, successful immune response has occurred. Um, so the, if a new variant has, has um, emerged in that individual, if the natural immune response is strong enough and in, in a large number of people, not everybody, unfortunately, that uh, immune response is good enough to get rid of it, then it may, you know, theoretically it can emerge, but it may, it, it's unlikely in that scenario that it would have a, a consequence for, for the population overall because the immune response is handling it and is eliminating it from the body. Yeah, I'd say um, for the vast majority of patients, um, they're not likely to stay infected long enough for um, a new variant to be selected for and to become much more harmful. And this is much more likely to happen with someone who has a, a poor immune response, like an immunocompromised patient. Thanks, Louis. Um, I believe we have time for one more question. Um, if, yep, there we have. Uh, so Michelle asking, could high transmission of the virus during the time it takes to vaccinate an adequate number of people lead to foster mutations or better higher than normal evolution pressure? If so, how could it be avoided? I mean, I guess it's uh, possible uh, and it is a concern that that could happen, um, that the vaccine, uh, a poor vaccine would, in, would drive for virus mutations. Um, whether they're faster or not, or more um, virulent or not, um, it is, it's, it's a potential concern. So that's why we need vaccines that work and uh, prevent disease in the first instance and uh, prevent a virus growing within a person that can uh, become, that could mutate and become more, more uh, virulent or, or transmissible. So if you have a good vaccine that prevents disease and a vaccine uh, preferably that would prevent transmission, then um, you you avoid that. If you have a poor vaccine, that would be a concern. And that's a concern that we've had with other vaccines and other diseases in humans and, and animals as well, that that could happen. I think this comes back to what I said before, that um, just simply if you have a virus population that keeps on growing exponentially, 
you have a huge supply of mutants occurring. And if you're not driving down cases, then you might have um, new variants arising while you're still trying to vaccinate. And it could occur that one of these variants might um, escape from your vaccines that you're using. Um, I think a, a complete escape from the vaccines we're using is unlikely. Um, but I think um, it is important to keep case numbers down for that exact reason. And I think that comes back to as well, the if a vaccine can induce a broad immune response that's targeting multiple different parts of the, of the uh, sequence and the structure of that antigen, then it's much less likely to happen as well. So it's about the quality and the breadth of that re response as, as well as the, the height and the magnitude. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the discussion brought to you by the conversation. I just want to thank our panelists for their time and their fascinating insights into this important topic. Uh, thank you, Professor Sharon Peacock, Dr. Louis Duplessis, and Dr. Anne Moore. And thank you, Gemma Ware, our head of audio, for making this production possible. Um, thanks to all of our viewers for joining us today for, and with for their excellent questions. Until next time, goodbye. 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 Bye.